function, which gave us from gamma and gave us this group von Neumann algebra, which we denoted by L gamma. And this sits inside of bounded operators in L2 of gamma, uh, which is just the von Neumann algebra generated by the left regular representation. So that's this von Neumann algebra. And yesterday we ended by showing that uh, if you have two groups and they have isomorphic von Neumann algebras, uh, if one group is amenable, then the other group is amenable. And in fact, we, if you look at the proof, we did this kind of in two steps. Uh, and the two steps we did is we showed that if gamma is amenable, then L gamma has this, uh, or B of L2 gamma has this natural state. Uh, and if, uh, which is, uh, which L gamma is in the centralizer. So what we showed is if gamma is amenable, so then there is a state phi on B of L2 of gamma uh, such that uh, phi of xt is equal to phi of tx uh, for t and b of l2, x and l gamma. And we also showed that if you restrict uh, this map phi to l gamma, you get the uh, canonical trace that we constructed before. So this was one direction that we proved. Uh, and then the other direction we proved is that conversely, if you have such a state, so Khan called this a hyperstate uh, or a hypertrace rather, because it's a trace, but only if you restrict to T in here and X in here. So it's a hypertrace. And, uh, and conversely, we showed that if there exists a hypertrace for L gamma, then the group gamma has to be immutable. Uh, so this is uh, actually an if and only if. So. so those were the two parts of the proof. And this is maybe a bit more transparent of what's going on writing it like this, uh, because it's known the existence of a hyper hypertrace is equivalent to L gamma being injective. Uh, so let me prove that. So let me first define you what injective is. Uh, it's already been mentioned in today's lectures. So a von Neumann algebra M is injective if there is a conditional expectation. from B of L2 of M or any representation that it's normally represented on uh, to M. So a conditional expectation, what I mean here is it should be a projection uh, from B of L2 to M, which should be uh, norm one or equivalently, it should be uh, completely positive item Um, Those are equivalent. Uh, so let me give you a lemma here. I believe this is really just an observation of Khan that in fact, uh, the existence of a hypertrace is equivalent to injectivity. So the lemma states that, uh, so M is a hypertrace on B of L2 of, G or B of, L2 of M. if and only if M is injective. Uh, so one direction here is, is pretty obvious. That is, uh, if M is injective, so that therefore you have this conditional expectation. So let's suppose we have a conditional expectation E from B of L2 of M to M. So then to obtain a hypertrace, uh, all you need to do is just compose it with the trace on M. So then set V of T to just be the trace of E of T. And then to see that this is a hypertrace, you just notice that conditional expectations are automatically bimodular with respect to M. So then you get that V of XT, this is the trace of 
uh, now we can pull the x out of the expectation. And now we can use the trace property, which says this is the trace of dtx. And then we can put it back inside the expectation. So this is v of dx. Uh, so that's one direction. Uh, for the other direction, you can do as follows. So if we have a hypertrace, so in particular, this is a state on V of L2. And so you can consider the GNS uh, representation with respect to the state. So we consider first the GNS representation from V of L2 to bounded operators on some other Hilbert space, which has this uh, cyclic vector uh, in this. So that V of T is T. Uh, so then the thing to notice is that uh, I required that the, well, the hypertrace in particular restricts to a trace on M. Uh, so I required that it gives the trace on M. Uh, so this means that if we look at the map, so if we look at the map from M to pi of X C, well, then this actually gives an isometry from L2 of M into uh, H. So this gives isometry from L2 to M respect to tau into H. And let me go ahead and call E the projection, orthogonal projection onto L2 of M in here. Uh, so then what can we do? Well, then we can define a map. So I'm going to define a map phi from bounded operators on L2 of M. And it's going to map, or sorry, bounded, yeah. And it's going to map back into bounded operators on L2 of M. And it's going to be just, uh, first I'll take the GNS representation pi, and then I'll cut down by this projection E, which, which gets us back into L2 of M. Uh, so this is, uh, let's see, let me copy over some of this. Uh, so here we have, so I'm going to define this uh, map phi by phi of an operator t is nothing but take the GNS representation, apply it to phi, and then cut down by this projection E. Jesse, there's a question from the chat. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I don't always see the chat right away, so please interrupt me if there are other questions. Uh, are the traces now assumed to be finite or sem semi-finite as we had yesterday? Uh, so in this case, M is going to be a uh, finite, uh, finite trace. Thank you. Yeah, my general, uh, so generally speaking, I'll use uh, tau, the notation tau, whenever, whenever I'm using a finite trace, and I'll use the, the notation tr whenever I'm using a semi-finite trace. So that's just a general, general notation in my lectures. All right, thank you. Uh, so this gives us a map from B of L2 to B of L2. Uh, clearly, this map is is uh, completely positive, so it preserves uh, positivity and amplifications. It's just a combination of a homomorphism with uh, with uh, conjugation by a projection. And the other thing to notice is that uh, if you restrict to x and m, well, because we had this isometry, which was also uh, left modular with respect to m, that this will be the identity on it. So note. That phi restricted to M is the identity. Uh, so we do get that it is the identity. Uh, so to complete the proof, all I need to show is that this phi is actually the conditional expectation we're looking for. That is, we need to show that the range of this map is already inside of M. So how are we going to show that? Uh, so we're going to uh, show that by showing suppose that we have x, y, and z and M, and we have T and B of L2 of M. 
And then I want to consider what is this phi of t. Uh, then I'm going to multiply it by, say, z op. So remember, m x on, it, on L2 of m by left multiplication, which gives us our standard representation of m. Or we can act by right multiplication, which gives us a representation of the opposite algebra. Uh, and so we act here. And then I'm going to apply this to x which I'm going to think of in L2, into Y, which I'm going to think of in L2, and I'm going to compute this inner product. All right, so this is easy enough to do because we know Z is just acting on X by right multiplication. Uh, and then we know also that phi is bimodular with respect to M. And so we can rewrite this as just uh, going to be exactly um, the inner product here of uh, E, and then here we're going to bring y to the other side. So this is y star, uh, or there should be a pi here, e pi y star t. And then we're going to have x and then z. And then times c times c. So that's just writing out the formula for our definition of uh, phi. And then uh, what do we see here? Uh, we see that, um, uh, where did I go? So this was the GNS construction. So this is nothing but phi of y star t x z. And by hypothesis, this is a hyper, hyper trace. So here we have an element in M, so we can move it to the other side. So this is phi of z y star t x. And then again, I can just by symmetry, I can rewrite this. This is going to be the inner product here of, and now you're going to get z up on this side, v of t, and then x hat y hat. All right, so what this computation shows is that this element v of t, whatever it is, well, it satisfies this. In particular, this is for all x and y in a dense subset of L2. So therefore, what you get is that phi of t, whatever it is, uh, lives in the commutant of m op, which I already mentioned last time is just m itself. So that's how you prove that it uh, maps in it. All right, so hyper traces are really in bijective correspondences, uh, bijective correspondence with conditional expectations, in fact. All right, so that's amenability. Uh, but this was not, so this gave us one way to distinguish uh, two and factors. In fact, it's not, uh, yeah, I should also mention the result of Kahn, which has already been mentioned earlier today from uh, 1976. And that is in fact, uh, so we know that amenability is an invariant. I should also mention this argument I gave yesterday that amenability is invariant. This is due to Jacob Schwartz. Uh, and Kahn uh, showed in fact that it's, uh, on one side, it's a complete invariant. So if we have uh, M, so rather, Khan showed that there is a unique separable uh, two one factor, uh, injective two one factor. So among amenability, there's really not much more we can say. So usually if we want to study group on Neumann algebras, uh, we look in the non-amenable world. Uh, so, but, so this, uh, the, the actual first tool to our first invariant to distinguish von Neumann algebras has another sort of amenability type flavor. And that I wanna mention right now, which is property gamma. So here's a definition. So a finite von Neumann algebra. So M, and I'll always assume my finite von Neumann algebras come with the normal faithful uh, trace, finite trace, uh, has property gamma. If there exists a sequence uh, un of unitaries in M uh, 
such that it's sufficiently non-trivial. So for that, I'll, I'll just ask that the sequence UN converges to zero in the weak operator topology. So it can't be a constant sequence, for instance. Uh, and then I'll want it to uh, asymptotically commute with everything in M in the strong operator topology or the norm two topology. And UN X minus X UN and norm two goes to zero. And I'll just remark it's an easy exercise to show that the unbounded sets, the norm two topology is the same as the strong operator topology. So this is the same as asking strong operator topology commute. Uh, so this is the definition. This was uh, Marian von Neumann's original invariant for von Neumann algebras. And we have uh, uh, an easy example. So there's a natural class of examples. And, and that is if we take the unique injective two one factor, we can write it, uh, the hyperfinite two one factor, we can write this as a union of two n by two n matrices A, and some closure in the strong operator topology. Uh, or we can think of this as an infinite tensor product of two by two matrices over the complex numbers, some uh, limit of this. And then, uh, so some completion of this algebraic tensor product. And then there's a natural sequence of unitaries you can look at. You can just set uh, UN to be this unitary here, thinking about it as an infinite tensor product. You just take the identity, tensor the identity, uh, and then you do this n times, and then you take your favorite uh, non-trivial elements about something like uh, this, and then tensor the identity, et cetera. So where you have, say, n copies of one. So this definitely gives a sequence of unitaries. Uh, since this matrix, this unitary here, here has trace zero, you can see that uh, the sequence converges weakly to zero. But also since you're kind of pushing this uh, non-trivial part out further and further, um, that this will commute with more and more of the uh, beginning copies of two by two matrices, and therefore will asymptotically commute with all elements in the strong operator topology. So this is the canonical example of property gamma. Uh, so the injective to one factor has property gamma, uh, but moreover, we could also repeat this argument in fact, if we take any, say, finite von Neumann algebra, and then we just tensor the hyperfinite to one factor, then you take those same unitaries, just view them as an R, and they already commute with everything in M, so this has property gamma. But need not be injected. Uh, on the other hand, we have this uh, a result of Efros. Which I'll mention here, and that is that uh, if you have a group von Neumann algebra, and if L gamma has property gamma, so then there is a conjugation invariant state uh, on L infinity of gamma. So we saw before that amenability was the existence of a left invariant state on L infinity of gamma. But of course, gamma acts on itself by both left and right multiplications. So you can ask, is there a conjugation invariant state? Uh, let me give this a name. And of course, I'll also want to avoid the triviality uh, so I'll say such that V restricted to C0 of gamma is identically zero. That avoids taking the Dirac function at the identity, for instance. Uh, and then I'll give a quick sketch of the proof here. Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, specifically, what you do is you define a state. So V on V of L2 of gamma. So I should start with given the sequence UN as in the definition. So we'll define the state uh, by uh, taking any 
weak star uh, cluster point of the states which tend to take an operator to t, and then I'll just look at these vectors here, which are in L2. Uh, and then uh, a couple things, and then what do you do? Well, how do you find the state on, on L infinity of gamma? Well, remember that L infinity of gamma embeds naturally inside of B of L2 by pointwise multiplication operators, or if you think of these by gamma by gamma matrices, these are just diagonal matrices. And so now you just restrict to L infinity of gamma. And the point is, is that since uh, the UNs are almost, well, since they converge weakly to zero, uh, this says that this state here vanishes on the compact operators. And hence the restriction to L infinity will vanish on C0 of gamma, which are contained in the compact operators. But on the other hand, uh, because the UNs asymptotically commute, compute with everything, uh, you have the computation that a T of uh, V, V op uh, T and then V star, V star op, that this will equal V of T, and this is for V in any unitary in L gamma and T in V of L2 of gamma. So in particular, taking V to be the left regular representation, well then V op is the right regular representation, usually denoted by rho T. Uh, so if this is this and this is this. And in this case, if T is some F and L infinity, which we think of as a diagonal operator, then you just check that this operator right here is exactly the action by conjugation. So then and the T rho T F uh, rho T inverse and T inverse is just equal by F compose and then the action by conjugation. Uh, it's possible I've forgotten an inverse there somewhere you might need to check that. Uh, okay, so that's Ephros's theorem. So in particular, we have, uh, you can also get a non-example. So Ephro called, Ephros called this prob property inner amenability. And so Ephros showed that property gamma implies inner amenability. Uh, so we have the following example. Uh, F2 is not inner amenable. And if you're familiar with the proof that F2 is not amenable, then you'll be familiar with the, the proof here that it's not inner amenable. It's really the same proof. I can draw it in a picture. Uh, if you draw the Cayley graph of F2, so over here, we have all the things that uh, say the elements that start with A and then have something else. Up here, I'll have all the things that start with B, if I'm thinking of F2 is generated by A and B. Here, I'm gonna have everything that starts with an B inverse. And here, I'm gonna have everything that starts with an A inverse on the left when you write out these words in reduced form. And then the computation here that you just have to remark is that if you look at uh, A inverse times A times A, so if you conjugate the set by A, uh, then you'll get exactly B union B minus union A. So this is a quick uh, um, computation. So what does that mean? That means that if you had a conjugation invariant state, well, it should give the same weight to A as it does to A union B union B minus. So in particular, therefore, it has to give zero to B union B minus. And then by symmetry, it also has to give zero to A union A minus, which means that the entire weight of the state has to be concentrated at the identity 
but we explicitly ruled that out, that possibility. Uh, so that shows that F2 is not interminable. I should remark that the converse to F Rose's theorem is not true. Uh, so the converse does, um, the converse does not hold. And this is a result by Voss from not so long ago, uh, 10, 10 years ago, or much, uh, about 10 years ago or so, 10 or 15 years, about 10 years ago. Uh, okay, so uh, so it's actually still an open problem. Uh, so property gamma, um, yeah, so it's inner amenability is not the same as property gamma, but it is an open problem if inner amenability is an invariant of the group von Neumann algebra. So I'll make that as a remark. All right, so the next form of amenability or invariance, now I want to jump quite a number of years from Murray and von Neumann uh, to now we're in the 2000s and I want to talk about some work of Ozawa. So let me give you a definition. So for the rest of today's lecture, if I forget to make an act, um, uh, if I forget to correctly cite somebody, then just know that uh, all these results or Ozawa or maybe Ozawa Popa. So here's the definition. So suppose that we have an action of a discrete group on K and K here is compact Hausdorff. So this is an amenable action and this should be an action by homeomorphisms. Uh, is an amenable action if there exists a sequence uh, mu n mapping uh, k to the probability measures on gamma, which you can think of as sitting inside of say, this is a discrete group. So the probability measures just sit inside of L1. Uh, if there exists, uh, exists a sequence uh, such, that, such that mu n is continuous, and we have that the uh, soup over all k and k of mu n of tk minus, then we can, I'll explain what everything is here. So this uh, goes to zero and this is for all t and gamma. Uh, so here we have the action of gamma on k, but also gamma acts on itself by left multiplication and hence the push forward action acts on the space of probability measures. And so that's what this action is here. And uh, of course, you can't ask that this be an equivariant map because that would automatically mean that your group is uh, finite or something like this. Uh, and then, so what you do is you ask that it's asymptotically equivariant in this respect. So why is this called an amenable action? Uh, so this, uh, I believe was actually introduced by Anant Anantalaram de la Roche, this notion. Uh, and the reason it's called an amenable action is the example when K is a one point set. So then there's only a single K so that the action part here goes away if we take the trivial action. And all this is saying is that we have a sequence of probability measures on gamma, which are more and more invariant under left multiplication. And this is equivalent to amenability. So gamma acting on is amenable, but only if gamma is amenable. Uh, and in fact, uh, a bit more, if you have an amenable action and there's any invariant measure, then your group is amenable. In fact, if you take any action, Okay, has a 
gamma invariant measure. So then uh, gamma is immutable. Uh, basically, just like in the fixed point case, here you get an almost invariant mean. If you have an invariant measure, then you can integrate uh, this function mu n to get an almost invariant probability measure. Uh, so these are, uh, this is the case. Let me give you one example, again, having to do with the free group. So again, I'll draw a picture. So here's F2, and it's going to act on its uh, Gromov boundary, which is the boundary of the tree. So it's all geodesics from, say, a fixed point, the origin, to uh, infinite geodesics infinite geodesics starting at the, the origin here. So this is the boundary of uh, F2. And I claim that this is a, an amenable action. And indeed, how you can check this, there's a nice picture you can draw. So if we have some, so let's go ahead and fix some sort of, you know, some omega here on the boundary. And then we can draw, so we want to compare uh, what is, um, uh, we want to compare the actions so we can compare what is, uh, um, yeah, we want to look at S omega. So let's look at the origin and you can think here, here's some path going to S omega. So we'll fix S and F2. And then we want to compare this also with what happens if we look at, um, uh, well, let me draw the picture here. We can also start at S, and then there's a unique geodesic also, which flows from S to S omega. All right, so this is the picture to keep in mind. We have this little um, triangle here in the tree. Uh, so then how do we do this? How are we defining, let's define mu n, and this is going to map the boundary of F2 to the space of probability measures on F2. And this is going to just be defined by mu n of omega is just going to be, we'll just take the first n steps going from the identity to omega. So we'll look at the uh, first n steps. So k goes from one to n. And then we'll take the Dirac mass at each of those. So now we take the path from the identity to omega. So I'll think of this as the kth vertex from the identity to omega. Uh, and then we divide by n to make it a probability. Uh, so what is, what is this doing then? So um, now we wanna compare over here. This is the formula we want to try to verify. And so what do we do? We first look at un of S times omega, so that's this. And we see what is mu in here. Maybe I can use a different color. So mu in here is gonna be the first n steps right here. And so this is gonna be mu in is just gonna be the average uh, of the probability measure on these steps. But on the other hand, if we look at uh, the left, the right hand side here, so there we're looking at uh, mu n of omega, and then we're just shifting up by s. So if we look at this point right here, and we go n steps, then this is going to be s, you know, so this is mu n omega, and this is gonna be s, uh, or s omega, and this is gonna be s mu n omega. And so we see the difference of these is exactly gonna be at most the distance from s to the identity. So in fact, we get a nice uh, explicit formula here. We get that mu n of s omega minus s mu n omega is in fact always less than or equal to one over n times the distance from s to the identity. And this goes to zero as n goes to infinity um, uniformly on omega. So that shows that this is, is exactly an amenable action. 
the next thing that I'll need, the notion I'll need from immutability. So I'll, I'll also remark that, so here's a theorem which is very useful and that uh, the action on a space K is amenable if and only if when you look at the crossed product, the reduced cross product, this is nuclear, which is if and only if the bidual of the cross product is injective. So the bidual will be a von Neumann algebra. So this is the, uh, this is the, if you like reduced cross product, it's nuclear full cross product, it's the same, but this is the C star algebra cross product, not the von Neumann algebra. Uh, so this is a theorem that I won't uh, discuss the details of. In fact, in this generality, it's quite a deep theorem, which uses uh, the full strength of, of some of Kahn's work and Tamita Takasaki theory. So it's, it's rather involved. So I'm gonna take this as a, as a black box in my lectures. Um, but that's maybe one of the importance of amenable actions. Uh, so the next notion I'm going to need is is now back to groups. So let's uh, so again fix a group, and let's consider this uh, C star algebra A inside of L infinity. So this is going to be the set of all f and L infinity by gamma, such that if you look at f and you then take a right translate by T. So I'm writing R sub T for the right translation action by F. And let's ask that this is in C naught. Okay. All right, so let's consider this set. Uh, so a moment's thought, you'll uh, notice that uh, A is a C star algebra. L infinity of gamma. It also contains the, the C0 functions. Uh, so that's clear. Uh, but in particular, since it's a C star algebra, uh, it has a spectrum. So we can write it as continuous functions on some space. So therefore, we get that A is equal to continuous functions on some space. And I'm going to denote the space by gamma bar, uh, the space. So we also have an action here, notice. Uh, so gamma acts on A by left multiplication. And so we have an action of gamma bar. And since this contains the compact operators, we also have a natural copy of gamma sitting inside here. So the action of gamma on itself by left multiplication sits inside here. So this is some compactification of uh, gamma. And then we'll also set uh, delta gamma uh, to be the boundary, the corresponding boundary. So this is the closure take away gamma. So gamma will sit, gamma embeds in here as a dense open subset. And then we also have the natural identification, continuous functions on the boundary can naturally be identified with this C star algebra A modulo uh, C naught. Uh, so this is the boundary that Ozawa called the, uh, the small smallness at infinity boundary. Uh, and I believe it's been studied even before in the past under different names. Uh, but now they, now let me give you a definition. So a group gamma is bi exact. if the action of boundary on this uh, boundary, the smallness at infinity boundary uh, is amino. So this is the definition of a bi-exact group. Uh, and to maybe motivate this and, and give you a reason why this, uh, to show you that this phenomenon actually exists, let's again give the example of a free group. So here we're going to have gamma to be F2. 
And again, we can take the uh, boundary, so the Gromov boundary, which is the space of geodesics of the free group, uh, so that we know that gamma x on the boundary of the free group, and we know now that this is an amenable action, uh, but I claim that this is actually just a factor of uh, this action here. Uh, so specifically, what do we notice? We notice that uh, if, so the key fact we need, which is easy to check for the, for the, the free group, so that is that if we take some element on the boundary of F2, uh, and say, say we have a sequence Tn converging to omega where the Tn's are in F2 itself. So we have some omega out here and we take some sequence T1, T2, et cetera, converging to this element of the boundary. Uh, so then what do we have? Well, now if we look at uh, say S TnR, well, it's not hard to convince yourself that this converges to S omega. In particular, that if we multiply by something on the right, you see that as the Tn's get to omega, it sees less and less of this multiplication on the right. Uh, so what does this mean? This means that uh, therefore, if we have some function, which is a continuous function on the boundary here. Uh, and now we think of this as sitting inside of L infinity of F mu or L infinity of F2. Then the fact that this action extends the boundary continuously, um, or sorry, I wanted to do completion here. So this is the Gromov completion. So the fact that this action on the right here extends to the trivial action on the boundary exactly says that if you shift this F by right translation, it doesn't change its value on the boundary. So we get that therefore F minus right translation by anything T of F is NC naught of gamma. So IE, now we get that thinking of these continuous functions inside of L infinity, this is contained in the C-star algebra A, uh, which exactly says that continuous functions on the Gromov boundary can be contained in continuous functions on the smallness at infinity boundary. So what do we get? We get continuous functions on the Gromov boundary. We can think of as sitting inside of continuous functions on this boundary. And then of course you have a natural map from the spectrum uh, to the other spectrum. So we get this map phi and this will be an equivariant map from here to the boundary itself. And this will be a gamma equivariant uh, continuous map. Well, what does that mean? Well, we know that this action here ha is an amenable action. So therefore we know that there's a sequence of maps here to the probability uh, measures on gamma, the sequence here. And so then we can compose them with this gamma equivariant map pi. And then we see that the action on this, this boundary itself is also amenable, uh, which shows that uh, the group is bi exact. Uh, so that uh, gives an example of a bi exact group. Uh, so this is typically a rank one type phenomenon. In fact, uh, uh, all lattices and, and rank one groups are, are by exact. And, and there are many other examples as well. So for instance, uh, all word hyperbolic groups. And if you see the picture here, uh, the picture I gave before, where did it go? Uh, this picture right here that I gave for free groups, for proof of free groups, uh, this is a typical picture you see when you're working with word hyperbolic groups. And, uh, and exactly more or less uh, pushing this idea through, uh, this gives it. 
Uh, oh, there's a question. Does inner amenability imply by exact? Uh, so amenability implies by exact because if you're amenable, then every action is an amenable action. Uh, but actually, uh, no, that um, uh, there are plenty of inner amenable groups which are not by exact. In fact, uh, I'll mention, uh, so for instance, if your group, um, uh, anything direct product with the integer say, will uh, any non-amenable group direct product with the integers will not be by exact. And that'll be a consequence of a theorem of Ozawa, I'll just mention in a moment, but it will always be amenable. Uh, but other examples besides word hyperbolic groups, uh, we also have some more interesting examples like uh, Z2 semi-direct product SL2Z. So this is notable, this has a normal amenable subgroup. And we are, also can do things like say Z uh, reef product, um, any by exact group, so gamma. Which also has some normal amenable subgroups. Uh, the main source of examples of non by exact groups uh, comes from this theorem of Ozawa, this uh, very powerful theorem of Ozawa, which is that if gamma is by exact and if we take any von Neumann algebra, von Neumann subalgebra of L gamma diffuse. Uh, so then the relative commutant of B inside L gamma is injective. So this is a property uh, called solidity. So IE L gamma is solid. Uh, so this uh, proof, uh, so I don't want to go over my time, so I won't uh, give you the proof today, although I'll sketch it at the beginning of my next lecture. Uh, and um, uh, so this tells you many, many groups are, are not by exact, and this is quite a strong property about the group von Neumann algebra. Uh, but actually, so just to see that, say, products of a non-amenable group with an amenable group is not by exact, uh, that's easy enough to do just by the definitions I've already given. So if you want an exercise to think about, that's a good exercise to think about. Uh, but I also, uh, I should mention here, also uh, L gamma is, um, has property gamma. Uh, if and only if uh, gamma is immutable. you know, amongst by exact groups. So, um, uh, so therefore, uh, yeah, property gamma implies, implies that. Uh, yeah, as far as if gamma's inner amenable, then and by exact, does that imply that it's amenable? Uh, Maybe somebody in the audience knows this, they can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe this is a result that appears in the literature anymore. Uh, okay, but now I think my, my time is up, so I'll go ahead and uh, stop here.